Welcome back, everyone, to Pontus Fathom Press. Uh, this is podcast number two, Lovecraft's Necronomicon, The Picatrix, and Dr. John D. Uh, I want to jump into the Necronomicon sort of as a, a, a at first as an imaginary test, text, but then as sort of as it gets positioned in the mythos, how it kind of overlaps with our topic last week, which was notebooks and how there's that overlap gray area between dreams and imagination and even remote viewing and uh, and how Lovecraft in projecting this book sort of has created a monster here like this is really uh, it's so it's so iconic and it's uh, it's uh, it's such a meme let's call it even of the evil book right I mean we have it in Evil Dead and um, but at the same time, there is some kind of weird pseudo scholarship involved in it. And the fact that he calls out real figures through his imagination kind of lends itself towards towards uh, researching those connections. Right. Um, and, and, and in a way, it's kind of like what uh, Moldenhauer's genealogy of Cthulhu does by taking a text, the Cthulhu journals as a notebook and then to begin to posit Lovecraft's position with historical, uh, with Gnosticism and with religion. So it's a similar track to that. Um, maybe to start out with, before we go into the reading of Lovecraft's Necronomicon and then talking about Dr. D and, um, and the Picatrix, I just wanted to share this uh, concepts from Borges. The first one was this idea of the lab library of Babel, right? As we know, the Tower of Babel from the Bible, it's uh, where the confusion of language was the punishment um, after uh, a king is trying to build a tower to heaven and the work could not be permitted, so to speak. So uh, in, the, in the Library of Babel, Borges, who's great at this type of stuff, posits you know, all of these details, the universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite and perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries with vast air shafts between, surrounded by very low railings. In any of the hexagons, one can see interminably the upper and lower falls, floors. The distribution of the ga galleries is invariable. And he goes on to show, uh, he describes the books, the chambers that the books, the library is unending. I have traveled in my youth to libraries and have wandered in search for a book, perhaps the catalog of catalogs, now that my eyes can hardly decipher what I write. Once I am dead, there will be no lack of pious hands to throw me over the railing. I say that the library is unending. The library is a sphere whose exact center is any one of its hexagons. So then he kind of keeps going into the shape of the library, the, uh, the books of the library, the languages of the library, and again he starts to get into undecipherable characters now this is I really want to talk about this that'll be the topic of our next of our next week's podcast um, secret undecipherable char characters and I'll get back to that at the end I'll give you the pre preview of that but the other the other Borges uh, classic is Tlon Ukbar and Orbis Tertius I won't read from it but this is a great story in which there's an encyclopedia set and um, the author finds this encyclopedia set, and, you, and if you remember, the encyclopedia sets used to have the alphabetical range between the volumes. So this, you know, volume ten would would start with a certain thing, and then, and then he finds that there is a a passage that's between the two alphabet volumes. So it draws his curiosity in, and there ends up being all these entries in the in the book about a land that nobody knows about and yet there's all these details in that and then he starts to research it and it's one of those things with the more you start to research into this odd occurrence the more you find that there's been some is is reality shifted is this book from some other dimension and he throws doubt on all that we've known right so this kind of ties back to our topic last week by having an a mysterious book one starts to invoke something right there's an invocation there so maybe we can start with 
Lovecraft's uh, Necronomicon. It's a short, um, uh, there was a few references to the Necronomicon throughout Lovecraft's work, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, just take a look at the actual text of the Necronomicon. There is a great book, um, I'll talk about that later because it's, it's, it's footnoted in the introduction to the Picatrix. So let's just go through this short reading of the Necronomicon, the history of the Necronomicon. This story is often considered an essay, but its content is entirely fictitious, and it in, indeed was meant to be a hoax. It can be regarded as a work of fiction. Lovecraft evidently wrote it in 1927, as he told Clark Ashton Smith, that he was drawing up some data on the celebrated and unmentionable Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al -Hazred. Now, I've actually got ordered up a, the uh, Lovecraft letters on the way, so those will be interesting to dig into. I've never read his letters, other than how I've seen them referenced in, the, uh, in, other, in other books. Lovecraft added in one sentence referring to Dr. John Dee's translation of the Necronomicon. So this is interesting, right? He calls out Dr. John Dee by name, okay? Uh, original title, Al-Azif. In his last years, Al-Hazred dwelt in Damascus where the Necronomicon, Al-Azif, was written in, of his final death or dis disappearance in AD 738. Um, and then he goes on to say, in AD 950, the Azif, which had gained considerable though surreptitious circulation among the philosophers of the age, was secretly translated into Greek by Theodorus Philetus of Constantinople under the title Necronomicon. For a century, it impelled certain experimenters to terrible attempts when it was suppressed and burnt by the patriarch Michael. After this, it was only heard of uh, furtively, but in 1228, Olus Vormius made a Latin translation in the late Middle Ages, and the Latin text was printed twice, once in 15th century black letter, evidently in Germany, and once in the 17th century. So again, like Borges, he kind of pads all these details. This is like that trick of writers, even from Poe uh, and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, right? You have a, a, or Bram Stoker's Dracula, right? You're doing this writing, which is, you, you, you add all these details to make it seem like something, something, right? And yet at the same time, he comes in here and says, uh, Wormius's time, of preferably note, the Greek copy was printed in Italy between 1500 and 1550 and has been reported since the burning of a certain Salem man's library in 1692. Now, it existed in Salem where there's witch trials, so it's all this kind of inferences, right? And then here we are. An English translation made by Dr. D was never printed and exists only in fragments recovered from the original manuscript of the Latin text now existing. One 15th century is known to be in the British Museum under lock and key, and while the other is in the Bibliothèque Nationale at Paris. And this is a great weird typo here. A 17th century edition, the Widener Library at Harvard and at the Library of Miskatonic University in Arkham. And of course, at the Library of Buenos Aires. Numerous other uh, copies exist secretly. Still a vaguer rumor credits the preservation of the 16th century Greek text in the Salem family of Pickman. But if this is so preserved, it vanished with the artist R.U. Pickman, who disappeared in 1926. The book is rigidly suppressed by the authorities of most countries and by all branches of organized ecclesiasticism. Reading leads to terrible consequences. It was from rumors of this book, of which relatively few of the general public know that R.W. Chambers is said to have derived the idea of his early novel, The King in Yellow. So this is great also, where Lovecraft is calling out uh, his fan fanboy status of uh, Chambers, King in Yellow. And, um, and, uh, and again, another book, a play that is non-existent, right? In the book, in the, in the, in the, King in Yellow, we have uh, the idea of a play that is non-existent. Camilla, you should ask. Stranger, indeed. Casilda, time, it's, indeed, it's time. We have all laid aside our disguise but you. Stranger, I ne'er wear no mask. Camilla, terrified, aside to Casilda. No mask? No mask. The King in Yellow, Act 1, Scene 2. Wow. Okay, so uh, call out from H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Uh, does a shout out to R.W. Chambers and the King in Yellow here. And uh, 
but he also interestingly he calls out dr d right so now dr d we know is quite a character uh dr d uh was uh a man of many ta talents he was a true renaissance man in the court of queen elizabeth uh not only was he entrusted with um political and military type secrets but he was also uh, an astrologer alchemist and a scryer he had a black stone that he would scry and read from that and that's where um, D developed the angelic script right so the the story goes that dr. D and uh, Edward Kelly would uh, look into this polished obsidian stone and as they scribed into the stone they would ask the angels and they had invocations this book has some of those invocations like this is a notebook also uh this john this one of these books here is source books of enochian magic by joseph peterson you can see that john d would basically ask the angels as he scribed the mirror please show me some something and that's how he, he slowly pieced together um these images and when the images came, he would then translate the images into letters. And that's how he pieced together Enochian script. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite an odd task for a, a person to be doing, right? Uh, and Dr. D was a very smart man, so not sure what he was up to, but here you see some of these, these texts. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk about uh, secret languages revealed in texts or in visions. Because Jung even has an incident, and we're going to talk about that, that next week. In the Black Books, there's an incident where Jung has a dream of some strange calligraphy. Uh, so we'll, we'll go there next week. But uh, so interestingly enough, though, the, there was a famous book in Dr. John Dee's time that was an astrological book. And that was known as the Picatrix. And here is a great hardcover edition by uh, John Michael Greer and Christopher Warnock. Um, this is a, an edition of the first, an early astrological work um, dating back to um, the same times, the 1200s even, right? So, and, and this is the book from which most, most modern astrology kind of has its roots roots in um, from the Picatrix which is a real throwback to a time that it's very different than um, astrology that we think of because it was all talismanic it's a talismanic magic in which when one wants to do something or have some effect there's a number of different figures colors of garments sacrifices um, things to burn uh, objects to put together to build this talisman and if one does it when the stars are right and this is interesting right when the stars are right meaning during a certain transition of planets a certain transit of planets during a certain sign the that the talisman can be made so the the, the picatrix magic was all about talismanic magic and it was tied to when the stars were right and I think that's a great Lovecraft crossover now did Lovecraft know about this not sure I mean I, I can't wait to go into Lovecraft's letters but um, I'll have to do some research on, on into that but one thing I know is I do know that Lovecraft thought um, astrology was like a humbug or something like this right he just thought it was nonsense as a scientific thinker but I think unbeknownst to Lovecraft could it be that he was projecting something? Did he read about it in a library? I mean, was it just something that he uh, used as a device? Uh, interesting, right? Uh, the introduction to this Picatrix has a small two-page section here called the Picatrix and the Necronomicon that I'd like to read a little bit from because I think this is interesting. So, so again, is there some possibility that it's the Picatrix that's the book that was the Necronomicon um, it could be uh, I um, 
I want to go through what the authors of this book have to say about it. So the importance of the wizard as a professional figure itself reflected early in literature and folklore. In such figures as Merlin the Mage, who played a Merlin-esque role as a magical instructor to Alexander the Great, oh, uh, sorry, Mechanibus, who played a Merlin-esque role as a magical instructor to Alexander the Great in the medieval Alexander legends. The concept of the magical book containing all the occult secrets of the universe similarly, similarly found its way into the popular culture of the age. Just as wizards passed in turn from medieval legend to modern fantasy fiction, in turn the archetype of the secret book of occult lore found a new home in modern literature and produced a remarkable parallel to Picatrix itself. In the 1923 short story The Hound, pulp author H.P. Lovecraft first mentioned an imaginary tome of darkest magic titled The Necronomicon, written by the equally fictional Arab wizard Abdul al Hazred. The Necronomicon appeared frequently in Lovecraft's story from then on, along with equally imaginary tomes such as the Panotic Manuscripts, and evolved at the core text of an imaginary religion of evil. The cult of the Great Older Ones, terrifying beings from deep space who had ruled the earth in the prehistoric past and waited until the stars were ripe again to resume their dominion. By 1927, the Necronomicon had become central enough to his Cthulhu mythos stories that Lovecraft wrote out a few pages on its supposed history to help him keep his facts straight. And this is the part that we just read. I won't have to go into all of this. It does say he, uh, that Theodorus Philatus in 950 retitled it Necronomicon. Lovecraft interpreted this as an image of the laws of death, though this is not quite grammatical Greek, and a more accurate transi translation may be concerning the laws of death, or perhaps the concerning the dead laws, or I heard it pronounced the book of dead names before, but we'll see. So it's sort of a necromancy text if it's about dead names. The laws of the dead could be necromantic also, right? So in 1228, the Danish scholar Olanus Wormus supposedly translated into Latin and the famous British occultist John Dee, Elizabeth first court astrologer, made a manuscript English translation some centuries later. From that point on, the history discusses how different copies got to their places where they turned up in Lovecraft stories, which we read in the, when we read that. But the last years of his life, Lovecraft was having to fend off requests by fans and fellow writers that he find the time to manufacture the Necronomicon. His work fell into obscurity for several de decades after his death, but it found a newly appreciative audience in the 1970s. Uh, one uh, Necronomicon attempt, we'll call it, written by a group of New York occultists under the pen name Simon, appeared as a mass market paper black in early 1980 and became wildly popular among those members of the occult community. Unfortunately, no small number. Uh, so, so again, the, like the Necronomicon, Picatrix was also first written in Arabic, translated into Latin in the 13th century. Both books contain detailed instructions for rituals meant to call down unhuman powers from what we would now call outer space, including malefic magical workings of terrific power. Perhaps this is a great one. So, so yeah, the book that I was talking about earlier is uh, Daniel Harn and John Wisdom Nance's The uh, Necronomicon File. I've had this book before and I, it's, it's, it moved on. I am getting a new copy of it because I think this will be a great book to study. If you guys aren't familiar with this, The Necronomicon Files by Daniel Harns is a great collection of every reference of the Necronomicon, it goes a bit into the occult side of things, but then it also goes into the pop culture side of things. So again, like the references to Evil Dead or animes and all kinds of usage that Necronomicon shows up in video games. So you start to see how this one projection of Lovecraft of a secret book really takes control of the imagination. And then it starts to spawn again what is being spawned, right? What is this attention? You know, I think it's quite fascinating. It says here, finally, um, they point out that Lovecraft's knowledge of the occult was extremely limited, and there is no evidence that he drew on anything but a few popular occult expose in constructing the dire rituals of his imaginary cult. 
perhaps the safest generalization is that if Picatrix did not exist, someone would have had to invent it. And this is exactly what Lovecraft seems to have done. Okay, so that's just um, a little note on Picatrix inside uh, as perhaps a candidate for inspiring the um, Necronomicon. And maybe we'll wrap up with the idea of, well, well what is, what are we invoking here? So I think um, one way to think about this is whenever we have a book that we can't uh, know the limits of, again, back to Borges, he's got a great uh, map, the map that's the same size of the world. And when you go to the edges, the work hasn't been finished yet, or it's starting to fade just where the ruins are of the ancient civilization. So this idea that as, as we point out something that does not exist, like a, a book of evil spells that raises demonic things, suddenly it becomes an attractor to those kinds of things, right? And then suddenly we give this thing a name. And again, when I, you know, from our last week's lecture, we talked about um, how notebooks of the imagination are very similar to notebooks of dreams or the visions of the religious visions, right? So there's a weird overlap again between imagination, uh, hallucination, uh, miracle, and dream. So what I'm trying to infer here a bit is when Lovecraft dreams the Necronomicon or imagines the Necronomicon. The one word I've left out here is remote view it. Is there something that he was looking to? And it could be a simple psychological question that he had heard about the Picatrix and the, some of the dates line up with this and Dr. John Dee is, is a scoundrel, you know, in history. Uh, but again, angelic script, uh, strange script in the Picatrix, and, and, and I think the topic of next week's lecture will be about secret scripts. Because uh, even Jung in his black books, he had a dream of strange letters. Look at Tolkien. Tolkien had created the Elvish language, right? The Picatrix has symbols, whether they're astrological or alchemical symbols. Jung talks about alchemical symbols. I'm pointing here to Jung, but Jung talks about alchemical signals. John D infers from his scribed vision in the showstone Enochian script, right? And then even in psychoanalysis of Rilia, uh, there's a Necronomicon fragment, right? The Necronomicon fragment, uh, then those fragments are transliterated in the kind of Cthulhu Fatagan kind of script. But then there, an attempt at translating them happens. And this is where you start to say, okay, wait a minute, you're translating the gibberish now? This is, we're, we're really pushing, something is at work here when we start to look at this kind of imagination, this kind of projection, right? In, in Jung, it was, it was a dream of some kind of hieroglyphs, right? In John Dee, it was a vision in scrying a stone. Lovecraft, it was an act of imagination to come up with this text. And with the Picatrix, oh, sorry. With the Picatrix, it was part of a, a talismanic ceremony that was linked to astrology and, um, and alchemy. So what do you guys think? Um, something interesting here with Necronomicon, the Picatrix, Dr. John D. Um, let me have a comment, leave me a comment below. If you're interested in, um, Anything we've talked about here, leave a comment below. If you like what we're doing, uh, check out the links below uh, for my Patreon. That's one way to support us. The other way to support us is the links for the um, Psychoanalysis of Rilia and Genealogy of Cthulhu on sale at an online bookstore near you. Maybe Amazon can pick those up and support us. Uh, looking forward to hearing from everyone uh, in the comments and Let's meet next week to talk about uh, strange scripts that are transmitted through the imagination, visions, or some kind of initiation. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, and talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.